Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Reclamation Podcast, where our goal is to help you reclaim good practices for following Jesus. If we haven't met yet, my name is Tony, and I'm your host. With over a decade in the local church, I care deeply and passionately about helping you connect with Jesus in practical ways. Today on the podcast, Elizabeth Urbanowitz. She's from Foundation Worldview, and we talk about curriculum, Sunday school, we talk about sermons, we talk about what it means to teach the truth and how do we move and all of the things that are so important, so important to raising the next generation. She's a passionate educator, and I think you're absolutely going to enjoy and love this conversation. Of course, full disclosure, I think that about every podcast, which is why I put them out. (laughs) I hope it helps you. That's what I want. And that's my prayer. Every time I think about this podcast, my prayer is that you move closer to Jesus. So, hey, if this podcast does help, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button and share this episode with a friend, maybe somebody you know who would enjoy it. Every time you share it, I'm flattered and humbled. It's just so cool to think about how God uses this platform. So now, without any further ado, let's jump into this conversation with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me on today, Tony. It's great. (laughs) Um, We're going to jump into all the things, but one of the areas that I like to start with is um, asking people about their calling. How would you identify the calling that God has placed on your life? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's one that so many of us as Christians are wrestling through. And I once heard one of um mm-hmm. one of my pastors when I was just graduated from college, he said, you know, don't don't rely on some subjective feeling to know what your calling is. He was like, really dive down deep into the body of Christ and have them speak into, you know, what has God gifted you in? Where do they see, you know, like your passions lining up with God's heart? And so I know that's you really rung true in my own life that it was just really confirmed for me when I was in high school that God had gifted me as a teacher. And I love children and I love getting to work with them and everybody around me in the body of Christ was saying, Hey, Elizabeth, you're gifted at this. We think you should do this. And, um, yeah. And then I was started off my professional career teaching in a Christian school and just loved being able to teach, you know, children, the whole truth. And it was there during my time teaching at a Christian school that it was really confirmed for me that God had called me to continue teaching children, but in a different way than in a classroom setting that God had given me a real passion for helping the children that he had placed in my care understand the truth of the biblical worldview. You know, that it wasn't just some stories. It wasn't just some, you know, good things that we do because we happen to be born in the United States of America, but that actually the Bible presents reality as it truly is. Is And so it was during that time when I was teaching that so many different people confirmed for me, you know, hey, God has given you a passion for this. There's a real need for this in our culture. We think that you should pursue this full time. So for me, you know, that's that's what um, how really my calling was confirmed in my life. And I know for so many of your listeners, you know, that as that many of them, you know, know the calling that God has placed on their lives. And if they're still trying to figure it out, would just encourage anyone who's still in that phase of being like, Lord, what do you have for me um, to first be faithful with what God has placed? in front of you today, you know, do the next right thing, as Elizabeth Elliot would say, and then really dive down deep into the body of Christ and just ask those who know you, you know, where where do you see like God's heart lining up with the passions that I have and, and how can this be used in the body of Christ? I love that answer. I, I think that you've kind of already answered my next question a little bit, but I want to drill down on it. Um, discernment as it pertains to God's voice in your life. Obviously, you were mm-hmm. teaching in one area, and then you moved out, and you started this brand new venture, which is big and you know, basically one giant test of faith from from an outsider's perspective. But um, y- you know, how did you know when it was the right time to move? Obviously, talking to other members of the body, but what else went into that decision? Yeah, that's another really great question because I think it can be really confusing for us as Christians to know, like, how do we know, you know, when this is God's voice and when it's not? And, you know, part of the reason why this is confusing is we have this idea in Western culture that we're just supposed to kind of like wait around for this feeling, you know, and we follow this feeling and then move with this feeling. But then when we actually look to scripture, we're kind of hard pressed to find anyone in scripture who's like, well, I felt this way, you know, so I did this. (laughs) It's more like, you know, very clearly like the prophet speaking God's word. And we know from God's word that his word is primarily the way in which he speaks to us. Because Hebrews says, you know, at long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son, you know, so his word 
words, God's words as recorded through the prophets and then, you know, recorded through the apostles who followed his son are the primary ways in which God is going to speak to us. So if we're sensing that God is calling us to do something, we know that it can never contradict scripture, you know, so that's, that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Proverbs tells us that, that there's a wisdom in a multitude of counselors. And so that's usually the the general direction that I that I tend to take. And the way that it worked out in my life, you know, I don't know that that, that it's going to be the same for everyone. But in my personal life, you know, I never sat down and was kind of like, Lord, I want to start this ministry and I want to do that. I was just like, okay, God, like I see this problem with the children that you've placed in my care. <laughs> you know that that they come from great Christian homes, they're in a Christian school, they're in churches, but they don't really know how to think well and they can't filter all these ideas that are coming their way. You know, what can I do? And so I just sought to meet the needs of those children. That God had placed in my care. But then, you know, I'm not in the classroom anymore. Now I'm running a ministry that does this at large to help parents primarily, but also Christian educators and church leaders do the same thing. But the way that it worked out in my life is I just, in 2017, I just experienced this incredible sense of restlessness. Like it was like, I just couldn't stop being restless. And everybody around me noticed it and was kind of like, Elizabeth, like, what's going on? You don't seem like yourself. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and so at first I thought, you know, I think I'm just not practicing gratitude. You know, and scripture is clear that we are to practice gratitude. Um, you know, we're, we're to give thanks always and in all circumstances. And so I was like, okay, I think I'm just not practicing gratitude. So I spent a month of trying to be more intentional at practicing gratitude and, um, it still wouldn't go away. So that's when I asked others in my life. I said, you know, can, can you be praying with me? Just asking God to identify what is the root cause of this restlessness? You know, is it me not practicing gratitude? Is there some unrepentant sin in my life? Is the Lord trying to show me something? And so just spent two months with my pastor and his wife, my parents, and then two close trusted um, counselors, um, you know, mentors in my life and just said, Hey, can you just pray with me that God would make it clear? And at the end of those two months, everybody came to the same conclusion, Elizabeth, it seems like the Lord is moving you on to something new. And I was like, great. And what is that? <laughs> and uh, nobody, nobody had the answer to that. Um, but I took the next, like, just like I said, you know, just do the next right thing. So I took the next, next step forward and I went down to our head of school's office and I handed in my letter of resignation. And he said, what are you going to do next? I said, I don't know. I just know that God is calling me to, to do something new. And within four days, um, the Lord had provided me with a year's worth of rent. Somebody just wrote me a check and was like, Hey, I, you know, like the Lord's just telling me to cover your rent next year. And I was like, okay, I don't know how I'm eating, (laughs) you know, but, but I know I have a place to live. And, and throughout that, you know, it, it hasn't been like this one long smooth journey. You know, there was many months where I just, I didn't know where my, my, paycheck was going to come from, you know, or if, or if it would come from anywhere. And I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how I was going to start a company when I didn't have a paycheck coming in. Um, but you know, then a local businessman called me and was like, Hey, tell me about more about what you're doing. And told him and he was like, you know what? I really feel like God's calling me to give you an interest-free loan of up to a hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, oh my goodness gracious. I don't know that I need a hundred thousand, but 50 would be great. (laughs) Um, so just, you know, I guess that was a long answer to a very short question. So in my life, um, you know, sensing God's calling, you know, just involved this sense of restlessness, but then really seeking out wisdom from within the body of Christ as to, okay, what is the Lord actually calling me to do? And then each step of the way, you know, just doing the next thing without really knowing what the next two or three things are going to be, you know, just the one next thing in front of me. Mm. Yeah. I I appreciate the fact that it's like the next step, even it's, it's very much that Matthew six, right? Tomorrow has enough worry of its Mm -hmm. own kind of mentality, right? Like I'm just going to worry about today. I'm going to deal with today. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I, I hear in your, uh, story is the difference between thinking and feeling. And feelings Mm -hmm. are uh, a big part of your ministry today as we talk about the truth and what that means and looks Mm -hmm. like. Um, I I guess I want to start with the question, as we kind of set all this up, where do feelings live in our relationship with the Lord? Mm. Yeah, that's another really important question for us to think through. And I think... I think as Christians, the temptation is to take one of two extremes, either to just buy into the lie of the culture that our feelings are the most reliable guide to reality, you know, and then just following our feelings completely. But then the other extreme is just as tempting and also just as dangerous to just stuff our feelings and pretend as if we're emotionless creatures, you know, and we all tend to veer towards one 
or the other. And I tend, I'm more tempted to veer towards the let's just stuff everything and forget about it, you know, because I don't, I don't really, I have learned that my emotions are not a very accurate guide to reality. And I don't like being manipulated by anything. And I feel like my emotions are (laughs) constantly trying to manipulate me. So I'm very tempted just to, to stuff them. But when we look at the biblical worldview as a whole, we see that us as humans were created in God's image. And part of bearing God's image is being these creatures that he's created holistically. You know, you can't just divide us into body and soul or like mind and feeling, you know, we're, we're holistic. Like there, there is a term for the separation of body and soul. And that term is death. <laughs> you know, that that's what happens when, <laughs> when body and soul are, are, you know, divided. And so mm, we can't, you can't just divide good. us into these, you know, these different, um, facets. And so as as humans, our emotions are an intimate part of us. And they're part of being created as image bearers. But understanding the whole biblical narrative, understanding Genesis 3 and the fall of mankind, that means that our emotions have also been affected by the fall. So our emotions mm. are no longer an accurate guide to reality. Um, My friends at the organization Mama Bear Apologetics, in their first book, they had this sentence in the book that I just loved. They said, emotions are a great check engine light, but they're a terrible GPS, which I think is just such a wonderful analogy and explanation that our emotions are always telling us some kernel of truth. Like they're telling us something is right or something is wrong. And so as our emotions, you know, like as we're feeling things, I think it's really great for us to ask ourselves, why am I feeling this way? And then next to ask, is this emotion pointing me towards the truth or is it pointing me away from the truth? Because this is what we consistently see throughout the Psalms. You know, the Psalms are like, um, you know, they're proof numero uno that we should not stuff our emotions, you know, (laughs) that the Psalmists are constantly honest before the Lord. And there are some things, you know, there are some verses in the Psalms that almost feel embarrassing to quote, you know, when we think like, oh my goodness, like somebody really said this to God, you know, and it's, it's, actually his inerrant, infallible, inspired word. And so, but then the psalmist, as they're pouring out their hearts before the Lord, they constantly come back to the truth of who God is. And they're actually speaking over their emotions. You know, why are you downcast, oh my soul? You know, I will yet hope Mm -hmm. in the Lord. And so I think that's just a great model that that we need to, you know, teach ourselves and our kids that our emotions, you know, they're always an indicator of something, but they're not always reliable in pointing us to the truth. And so that's where, you know, our head and our heart need to come together and work together as a team to evaluate, okay, what do I need to do with this emotion and what is it showing me and how do I make sure that I am not deceived by this emotion? It's so funny you mentioned Psalms. I'm actually reading Psalms with about 15 guys, and we're uh, oh. so we're, we're doing a Psalm a day this year, every hmm. day. So we just we just hit Psalm 100 today, and the the disciple making conversation that goes along with that is often the psalmist is a lunatic or the psalmist is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> right? like, 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 like the extremes of the psalmist is amazing. It's a beautiful. <laughs> Well, what it is, it's just a, a beautiful representation that all things can go before the Lord. So mm. I think that that's a that's mm-hmm. a such a great point. Um, you know, in, in some circles, the work that you're doing uh, could be considered controversial. Um, mm-hmm. I, it's it's certainly in, in the culture that we live in today, and kind of uh, how people that have differing opinions in the culture can be treated. Uh, it certainly, at the at the very least, feels brave. Um, h- how has it been for you personally to step out on this limb and be like, "Hey, this is what God's word said, and this is the truth, and um, we don't get to decide the truth ourselves," and kind of mm-hmm. be so bold. Yeah, an interesting question, especially if, you know, there's anybody listening who's known me for a long time, because I am the type of person, I'm not a huge fan of conflict. Um, I love it when everybody gets along <laughs> well. Um, I'm also not someone who loves attention. <laughs> so um, so actually doing what I'm doing publicly is something that, that has been a really good and healthy part of the sanctification process for me. Um, because I think, you know, where we're living in this time and culture, we live in a time where we're hopefully coming to the end of like celebrity Christian <laughs> Christianity. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're very much used to, you know, like Christians with huge followings, you know, who 
who are getting, you know, millions of views. And not that there's anything inherently wrong with someone who's speaking the truth having a large audience. That's that's not and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. The thing that's wrong with that is then if that person is seeking that attention, um, you know, rather than pointing the attention back to God. And for those of us that are watching and following, if we rather than are fix rather than having our eyes fixed on Jesus, if we're fixing our eyes on that person, um, you know, because anytime someone in scripture who is not any any time any um heavenly being who is not god and is not on the side of satan and his demons is worshiped you know in scripture they immediately you know are like no 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 <laughs> like mm. go only god alone is to be worshiped you know we see that consistently when anyone falls before an angel or you know when um when paul and his ministry partners you know are start to be worshiped they're like whoa no we're we've kind of just given into that in in yeah. western christianity of like oh this person is amazing they can do no wrong if only i knew this person and so um, I think, uh, so to answer your question, for me coming out with this, I think the interesting thing is is, is um, just to be continually reminding myself that this is going to be hard. This is not like a celebrity Christianity thing. This is right. not, you know, like a, a gaining a large following, that this is trying to be faithful to God and his word and helping people understand how to faithfully make disciples of the children that God has placed in our care. Because, you know, we know that God is unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. So God and his word are unchanging. But what is constantly changing is the culture around us. And just as Paul models throughout the book of Acts of being wise to the cultural context in which he finds himself, we need to be wise to the cultural context in which we find ourselves so that we know how to prepare the children that God has placed in our care. Um, you know, how, how to best make disciples of them in this current cultural context. So just, just to sum up, um, I think the, the, you know, getting some pushback and, and I mean, the, the pushback I've gotten, I mean, in, in all honesty, Tony, I mean, is, is so, so small, you know, I mean, the, the apostles gave their life, yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they gave their lives for Jesus and, and we are called to die to ourselves daily, but I've received, you know, like I've received, I haven't received threats on my lives, you know, like people might complain about what I do or criticize it, but like, who really cares, you know, as long as we're being <laughs> faithful <laughs> to the work that Jesus has called us to. So all that to say, haven't received, you know, like any, any death threats yet. Very grateful for that. But just a, just a reminder that, that, you know, like all of us, whatever God's called us to do, we're to do that before an audience of one, whether mm. people are applauding, which um, we need to point that praise back to God, you know, or criticizing in which we need to say, you know, Lord, show me if there's any validity to this criticism. And if not, you know, give me the strength to keep moving forward. I am curious as somebody who is now um, studying cultural context, if, if someone were to come from a different planet, let's say, let's just make <laughs> believe here. And they were like, okay, Elizabeth, I want you to define what the cultural context of America is right now. Mm -hmm. um, how would you this is probably an unfair question, but how would you paint that swath, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, what, what picture are you painting from, from what you see uh, pouring into the next gen? Yeah, I mean, that question can be answered on so many different angles, and there's no way that in, you know, a few sentences that I can answer that question sure. well. But I think that, I think really the defining feature of this cultural context for the next generation is the vast amount of information that they're presented with hmm. and the um, artificial relationships that they're presented yeah. with online. So those are the two things that I think anyone working with the next generation really needs to focus in on that we don't, our primary focus shouldn't be relevance. Like, oh, we want to get, you know, in front of these kids, the people that they're going to think are cool. You know, like, do we want people that can build relationships with them? Absolutely. But what we really need to do is give them the skills that they need to carefully evaluate every idea that they encounter. Because in one year of a child's life, you know, in, in 2023, they're going to be confronted with more competing ideas, more competing truth claims than most humans throughout the course of human history have been presented with in their entire lives. You know, wow. so the truth of the gospel doesn't change. The truth of God's word doesn't change. God doesn't change. But the skills that we need to give them <laughs> to faithfully understand the truth of the gospel and God's word and who God is, that does need to change. We need to equip them to evaluate, carefully evaluate ideas. And then also relationship. You know, 
I know that you're very passionate about discipleship and making disciples. And when we look at Jesus's model of making disciples, you know, how he made the, you know, disciples of the 12, how much relationship was involved in that? You know, he didn't just sit down and lead a class once a week, but he lived with these men for three years and Mm -hmm. did daily life with them. And so we live in, you know, in just a time and place where so much is done online. Now, I mean, praise God for the advantages of that. You know, even this podcast that you and I are recording right right now, you know, we couldn't be doing this if the, you know, like there weren't these technologies that we could use. However, when most, uh, when most relationships are done online, that's not how God has created us that we, you know, like we actually need physical in-person relationships. And because the next generation is just around screens all the time. They lack just a lot of social skills that most humans in the past have just naturally picked up on. You know, I actually, I did the math and I noticed my second, my seventh year of teaching that I actually had to start teaching my students how to make eye contact, Mm. how to respond and smile when I said good morning to them. And when, when I did the math, those students were born in 2006 which was two years before the invention of the iPhone. So wow. from the time that they were able to talk, they were just surrounded by these constant screens. So all that to say, I think it's really, really important that we do those two things, that we really help the next generation filter through every idea that they encounter, and that we also teach them how to build relationships because i mean that's what the gospel is all about that god sent his son to reconcile us to himself the gospel is all about reconciled relationships so if we want the next generation to understand the truth of the gospel they have to understand relationships and what it means to be in relationship with one another Hey guys, just pausing this conversation with Elizabeth to remind you to check out our brand new services over at follow the number two leadcoaching.com. Follow to leadcoaching.com. Our goal here is to help Christian executives move closer to Jesus in practice and in thought. We talk about values, strategic planning, all of it goes into the dialogue. If you're interested in individual or group coaching, do me a favor, go to follow to leadcoaching.com and fill out the form. We'll link to it in the show notes. I deeply desire to work with you on a one-on-one basis and help you move closer to Jesus every day. Now, let's finish up this conversation. Yeah, when we talk about disciple-making around here, one of the things that we say, it has to be intentional, relational, reproducible, mm. and missional, mm. right? And and so we know when we're making disciples, when it checks all of those boxes, is that you should be able yes. to take all those tools into whatever community you're in and do that intentionally, relationally, and so forth. Mm. Um, Love that. One of the terms in your curriculum that I really liked is the idea of being an active evaluator. Um, and, and then that's one of the goals for your students. And I'm wondering if you can drill down on what that looks like. Because I, I imagine that there's a lot of even adults who are listening right now, which is most of my audience are going to be Christian adults, mm-hmm. uh, who, who don't know if they're an active evaluator. So mm-hmm. could you kind of give us a definition and then maybe a First couple of steps if we're, we want to lean into that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yes. The active evaluator is a term that I use a lot because, as I mentioned before, you know, just the vast quantities of information that are coming our way. And most of the time, you know, the opposite of that, rather than being active, we're passive. And rather than being an evaluator, we're a recipient. So if we're a passive recipient of information, I mean, it is kind of what a lot of us enjoy to do. <laughs> you know, even when you just think about like turning on Netflix or something, you know, it's like, sure. oh, it's like my brain break time. You know, like I just turn off my brain. And and I'm not saying to never have time to rest. You know, God, with the way that he set up the world with six days, we shall labor and one day we shall rest. Rest is important. You know, it is. It's important. It's a command um, from God. So I'm not saying to never rest, but we tend to take that to the extreme, you know, and just let Hollywood or, you know, whatever medium it is, TikTok, you know, for the next generation or whatever, just kind of feed us. And we're just passive recipients of this information. So if we want to become active evaluators, what we need to make sure that we're doing is that any idea that comes our way, we're thinking, hmm, is that true? 
or is it not true? And it doesn't mean that every time there's something that's not true, then we're like, bad, we get that, you know, like we stay as far (laughs) away as we can. (laughs) You know, we have to do a little chewing and spitting, you know, chewing and swallowing, you know, the meat and spitting out the bones. Um, But whenever we're in a conversation, whenever we turn on Netflix, you know, whenever we're reading a book, whenever we're at work, we're constantly thinking through, is this true or is this not true? And how do I know? And so for any listeners who who are thinking like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I have no idea, you know, like how to do that. I think a simple way, if you have kids in your life, you know, you just turn on a kid's show and you just start thinking, okay, what is this message? Is this true? Is this not true? Because with kids stuff, you know, for us as adults, it's usually pretty easy to do. And then we can take the next step up to say, okay, you know what? Let me watch a movie, you know, that's for adults or for teens. And let me do the same thing. Be constantly asking myself, is this true? or Is this not true? And before long, it just becomes a habit. So if you can start out simple mm. and just start thinking, okay, is this true? Is this not true? And then continue to go to, you know, like go a little one or two steps up. It just eventually becomes a habit. And when we can train the next generation to do it, the interesting thing, at least that I found in my experience is they love doing that because they're so used to this world. That's just like, let me entertain you, you know, and the laziness in our sinful fallen nature likes that. But when we all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, I have a responsibility here. I actually have to determine whether or not the things I'm being presented with are true. All of a sudden, there's some responsibility there. So you want your kids to take ownership in school and they're learning, teach them how to think well. And all of a sudden, they're going to be like, wait, I don't just have to do this homework because I'm told to do this homework. I actually have a role here to determine whether or not this is true. It completely changes the game for them. It's pretty amazing. (laughs) That sounds amazing, actually. And and I have to... It's caused me to evaluate, man, when's the last time I wondered if I was just being a passive? I mean, passive is just very easy to do, right? Like it's just, mm-hmm. it's just, we're conditioned almost, I think. Yes. So I, the, the curriculum that you guys have created is, is super interesting to me. And, and what's clear is that you guys have put a lot of research into it. Um, you yourself have two master's degrees. You've got a bunch of uh, contributors who are v- scholars in their fields. What was it like to put together this, um, these different sets of curriculum for different ages? What was the creative process like? I would imagine it's really hard to get something that feels what you created is more than just a, it's not like a book. It's, it's a whole process of, uh, intellectual disciple making for every age group. Yes. Well, I love curriculum development. It gets me, most people are probably like, oh my gosh, shoot me now. <laughs> um, but I love the curriculum development process simply because when I say curriculum, I know that sounds high and lofty and like you're about to read a college level syllabus. That's not at all what I mean. By curriculum, I just mean a systematic plan to get from point A to point Z and Mm. how are we going to get there? And so what my team and I do is we love learning more about how God designed the human brain to learn. And so we're constantly doing research, you know, on how does a human learn best? And, you know, one of the things that brain research has found that for all humans, but specifically when we're talking about children, it takes an average of seven exposures to the same content before that content really sticks and becomes part of someone's everyday thought pattern. You know, so rather than just being like, hey, kids, we're going to read you a book, you know, and that was great information. What we do is we actually have kids' bodies involved so that it's more more likely that the content's going to stick and we review things at least seven times to make sure that we're not just being like, hey, go through this curriculum so we can check it off in a box and make ourselves feel better about being parents, pastors, or Christian educators. But we're like, okay, we're going to actually transform the way that you think. <laughs> um, and so that gets me so excited just knowing how much kids are capable of and being able to say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're actually going to transform the way a child thinks. And then this is This also gets me excited. It's a terrible business model, but I think it's a fabulous discipleship model, is that by the time anyone is done with one of our curriculums, the goal is that they will not need us as an organization anymore for that particular subject. Like when we teach kids how to read the Bible... It's different than, and, and I'm not I'm not trying to in any way put down Bible study authors because I'm so glad that there are people out there sure. writing solid content and you know helping people study God's word. But one thing that kind of um, just bugs me a little bit about the way that we do Bible studies is we're constantly needing to come back to that Bible study author for help to read, interpret, and apply God's word. Where I'm like, God's word, like 
God has revealed himself to us. Like, yes, we can use different tools he's given us, but the average Christian should be able to sit down and read, interpret, and apply mm. and apply God's word without any help from some famous Bible study author. You know, so by the end of our studying the Bible curriculum, the goal is that kids eight on up, they won't need us anymore to teach them how to study the Bible, you know, that they will know how sure. to do that. So for all of our materials, that's the goal, you know, that they, you know, they have independence at the end of that. And so, so that really, excites me. You know, the, the actual process, um, you know, it's it's not linear. Sometimes it's a little circular, you know, just trying to figure out like, okay, how, you know, what do we need to get across to kids? Like, how do we do this? You know, how what's the best way to do this? And that's where I'm so grateful. You mentioned before that I have a team of people. And so sometimes people are like, oh, Elizabeth, you're like a one woman show. I'm like, if I was a one woman show, we would be spinning our wheels. Let me tell you, <laughs> because <laughs> I have like, I have a very specific skill set and a very limited skill set. And so praise God that he gifts people differently and he can bring us all together, you know, to, to, um, to continue building his kingdom, you know, as we function as the body of Christ. So that's just a little tiny taste of what curriculum development looks like and why I get so excited about it. <laughs> I am curious, uh, has it been a tough transition to go from, uh, being a teacher in the classroom to being, um, the executive director of a, of a ministry? It feels like in some ways managing chaos in both skill sets, but, <laughs> um, what's it, what's it been like for you? Uh, well, in a lot of ways, transitioning into business has been like baptism by fire on a weekly basis um, as I'm just learning <laughs> what it's like to run a business. But then again, that's where the body of Christ comes in, you know, and people that have different giftings that I'm mm. able to go to for advice. And, you know, people frequently ask me like, oh, Elizabeth, do you miss being in the classroom? And I always feel terribly guilty when I'm <laughs> when I'm about to answer and I say, no, I don't at all. And it has nothing to do with not liking teaching. Like, I'm so grateful for that decade God gave me in the classroom. But you know that that verse in in Proverbs um, I think it's Proverbs 34 7 or 37 4 I can never remember the exact reference but actually um it can't be 37 because there's not 37 um, chapters in Proverbs. Sorry, I can't remember the reference. Okay. But the verse that's very famous that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will... Oh, it's Psalms. That's what it is. So sorry, Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, people tend to think like, oh, you know what? Like, as long as you're following God, he's going to give you every single thing that you want. Where I think it's actually just the opposite. That as we're delighting ourselves in the Lord, God starts to conform the desires of our heart to his mm. desires. And that doesn't mean that there's never any struggle because we know as Christians, we have been promised suffering. We've been promised hardships. Um, and we've been promised that God will work all things together for our good by using all of those things to conform us into the image of his son. But I think as we start to delight ourselves in the Lord, he really just changes our heart. And, you know, as I was following God, as I was teaching, like he gave me this great love for my students and I love teaching. And then when it was time, he completely changed my heart in that I still love children and, you know, obviously with what I'm doing, but I no longer have the desire to be in the classroom. And I just love what God has called me to. And no, it hasn't always been easy. And yes, as I said before, it's baptism by fire, <laughs> you know, at least once a week um, and falling on my face here and there. But I just love what God has called me to. And so that's what I would encourage, you know, anyone listening to, um, you know, just, just to really be encouraged, just to continue seeking God, to be faithful where he's placed you, you know, even if it doesn't make you wildly excited and just trust that as you're faithful, God will change the desires of your heart. He will conform his, your desires into his own to give you peace mm. and joy where you are, even if it's not where you envisioned yourself being 10 years ago. Yeah. I, I, the phrase that the Lord's really put on my heart this last year has been joyful obedience mm. and which mm. is, feels a lot like that. It's like, okay, whatever, what, whatever you want me to do, Lord is what I want to do. Yeah. Yep. Even though, uh, sometimes my feelings get in the way to your point earlier. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so, you know, as this continues to get out into the world, I'm, I know that my podcast family loves to pray. What's kind mm. of the prayer that, that we can um, come alongside you with uh, when it comes to this foundation worldview and what God is doing in and through this ministry. What's the what's the long term prayer? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, so, really, our goal at Foundation Worldview is to help children carefully evaluate every idea they encounter and understand the truth of the biblical worldview. So, the number one prayer that that I ask people to pray is just for wisdom you know, for wisdom for us, because this, this ministry is the Lord's, you know, 
I, as I shared in the beginning, you know, if God had not miraculously provided in at the start, we wouldn't exist. You know, if he hasn't had not continued to sustain us, we would not exist. And I have no idea what the Lord's plans are for this ministry. You know, he could have us around for the next 100 years. He could have us around for the next two years, you know, and whatever he wants to do with this ministry, that's really his prerogative. So I just always pray for wisdom, you know, that mm. God would give us wisdom to make the right decisions at the right time. Um, I, I always, I also ask for humility because I think, um, I think that's one of the pride is at the root of basically every sin. And, um, you know, no matter what the Lord's plans are for this ministry, I know that myself and my team members, we need humility to be really listening to where the Lord is leading us and being faithful with what he's given us. So those are the, those are the two things that I, I usually ask for prayer for, for wisdom for us, and then for humility, um, mm -hmm. that God would give us a spirit of humility as we walk forward in, with us. That's wise it's, and beautiful. So, um, okay. Well, I have one more question for you, but before I ask it, I know that, um, my podcast family is going to want to learn all things about you and the ministry. Where can they go online to get connected and to keep track? Or, um, if they want to pick up a copy of the curriculum, where's the best place to do all that? Yes. Yeah, so our website has all that information and all the resources that we have as a ministry. And that website is foundationworldview.com. Again, that's foundationworldview.com. Right on. And we'll link to that in the show notes, of course. So last question I love to ask people. It's an advice question. And I am going to uh, go back in time and ask you to give yourself one piece of advice, except I get to name the season mm -hmm. of life that you're in. Ooh, okay. So I'm going to take you to the, um, the day that you turned in your resignation uh, as a teacher. If you could go back in time and pull up a chair and sit knee to knee and hold the hands and look yourself in the eye, what's the one thing that you're telling that younger version of Elizabeth about what she's about to embark on? Hmm, such an interesting question and a really good one. So I'll tell you what I would tell myself and why, because it might be applicable to some of your listeners and not Perfect. to others. <laughs> um, so if I could pull up a chair next to myself on that day, I would tell myself, Elizabeth, just enjoy where the Lord has you today. Mm. Enjoy where the Lord has you today. And not that that would take away um, any of the pain or the difficulty of the heartache of different seasons or even, you know, seasons I'm going to face in the future that I have no idea of. But I am very much the type of person that loves to have a plan. And that's not always a bad thing. Um, but sometimes with that desire to have a plan, I then start to sin by becoming anxious mm. and worrying what's going to happen if A happens or B happens or C happens. And um, yeah, so looking back, you know, hindsight is always, well, not always, but many times hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so looking back and just seeing the way that the Lord provided in so many miraculous and unexpected and sweet and difficult and challenging ways, <laughs> I would just tell myself, just enjoy where the Lord has you today, and trust him for tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being so generous with your time today and for the work you're doing for the, the Big C Church. I think, um, I think it's truly needed in this time period. Oh, thanks so much for having me on today, Tony. It's just been a joy conversing with you. Man, I told you guys, what a cool conversation. I love her perspective, and she's got such uh, a great worldview. I think it's important for us to wrestle with as the culture turns more and more away from Christianity. We have to decide who we're going to be and what we believe. And that just goes with anything when there's this much change. I think one of my favorite parts is this idea that when we divide the body and the soul, we're certain for death. And just how important the soul work is in addition to everything else. So again, hey, do me a favor. Let Elizabeth know that you heard her here on the podcast and share this episode with a friend. Guys, I'm so thankful for each and every one of you and the way that we get to connect on this platform. It means the absolute world to me. And your support is such a gift. So remember, guys, if you want to follow Jesus, you must be willing to move.